if I could do anything different there is I would at the very first time we decided to do the process connect to a whole bunch of people in your industry in Australia and don't fish for work or anything just establish that rapport with them where they say well cool great for connecting this is my knowledge this is your knowledge on this tell me a little bit about your projects tell a bit a little bit about what you do you know oh how do you guys do it in Australia because this is how we do it in South Africa we like being able to not have to worry about our safety around every single corner that we walk I'm Dr. Shamini Tablanche, ex-corporate and academia girl, turned CEO and board member of several companies and a mother of four little extraordinary kids. But it wasn't that long ago that I lacked the confidence, the know-how and the time to focus on designing and really going after the life that I so wanted to live. A life of freedom, of fairness and of being fair dinkum to who I really was and what I wanted to get out of this fleeting time that we have on Mother Earth. Fast forward to many lessons learned and moving halfway around the world to the most amazing country. You'll see the life that I now live. One that gives me more safety and freedom than I ever thought would be possible and that really only existed as a daydream while I was living in South Africa. I created Chamini TV to give you true spot advice on how you can also live a life in this amazing country and so that you can see how another couple like us now live in Australia with four little kids here in Down Under and I'll be providing you with step step strategies so that you can make your Aussie dream a reality too. If you're a keen future Aussie who's looking to create a life that excites you and offers you safety, freedom and opportunity, you have come to the right place my friend. Welcome aboard. Hi Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. It's lovely to see your smiley face all the way from sunny Sydney. How have you been? Hi, I've been well, thanks uh, very much. And how long have you been in Sydney for? Because I have an inclination that it's been uh, less than a year, is that right? Yeah, it's been less than a year. So we arrived on the 20th of November and we quarantined up in Brisbane and on the 7th of December we flew down after quarantine to Sydney and we're just staying with friends ever since. And why did you fly to Brisbane and then to Sydney? So it was all just a matter of which flights we could get. Uh, the flights we got were, um, they were with uh, Singapore Airlines. And at the time, everyone was booking given COVID and the restrictions uh, just to get themselves over to Australia. And we actually got in on a cancellation that someone else had made. So we got three tickets, being myself, my wife, and, and, and our daughter. And then um, we were able to fly over. And we didn't really have much of a choice. So we went up to Brisbane. Ironically, our flight landed in Sydney first. And then we had to stay on the airplane. Well, we, we, we had to go into the airport and then board another plane. And this is, well, it's probably the same Singapore Airlines flight going up to Brisbane only to come back after quarantine. Oh, goody. So you've almost been around Australia already without actually having seen yeah, that probably, much. I would say probably the East Coast, uh, you know, in terms of Brisbane and Sydney. Yeah, just not uh, any of Victoria yet or South Australia. Or Western Australia. Or Western Australia, of course. Yes, but <laughs> looking at the Eastern board. Uh, yeah. I know. It's so funny because so many Australians have never east on the east board has never been to western australia and and the other way around as well people from western australia who've never been to the, the eastern side and it's like wow it's interesting but they've been overseas heaps of times and they go to bali or to europe or wherever else it is all the time but they just haven't um, been on the other side of the island that they're at yeah, they won't they won't worry because it's what a six or eight hour flight from the east to the west so it's almost as if you're going internationally and then people might just think well why don't we just go internationally then that's exactly the other side of australia that's exactly right you almost see more of the same because same culture same kind of uh, yeah, buildings you know, and everything else same. it's all beautiful but a lot of it looks quite similar it's like South Africa, yeah. where you have Durban and Cape Town and Joburg, you know, yeah. the same language. Exactly. <laughs> so tell me, 
how, why Australia, firstly, and how did you guys come in during the middle of lockdown? So how we landed on Australia is my wife and I started talking um, and, and we, we were talking a lot about if we hit a certain age and, we, and we, then we need to make a decision about whether we are going to you know, settle down and just accept that we're going to stay in South Africa, given the, the age cutoff of 45 years of coming over to Australia. So we gave ourselves that and then we uh, reached a point uh, where we both turned 36, 37 odd, where we had to make a decision, do we immigrate or do we not, given the, obviously there's a lot of push factors, but we like to focus a lot more on the pull factors of Australia. So I think it's, it's by no surprise that everyone knows that there are push factors, the political instability, the, the, all your demographic statistics, your, your, like your prime rate and, your, um, and, and the like. So um, we, we drew up, uh, I drew up a, a spreadsheet that pretty much just listed like a SWOT analysis of all the countries. So I just did strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And then uh, uh, where our daughter featured stronger, those, ca those pros carry a lot more weight. So you would look at all the demographics, all the statistics for all the countries, but it boiled down in the end to, oddly enough, um, climate. And because in New Zealand, it rains a, a lot more. And in Canada, if you want to play in a snowsuit as a kid, then by all means, Canada, and I'm not saying Canada's bad, but just for us, we like more, more humid tropical weather. And um, that was part of the reason. And also a lot of Australia, you'll likely end up close to the sea or close to the coast. And then you can just go to the beach uh, and we are more beach people than we are, you know, bush felt people. If I can put it yeah, that way. So yeah. And in the outback, uh, some people love that. It's just not us. Um, but that's amazing. That's the first time I actually hear of somebody who's done a SWOT analysis for all the different countries, which is that is so good because you literally put all the things onto paper and you analyzed with an open mind what will work best for your family. Yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a combination of being analytical about it and doing your research properly on the internet, but it's also about just knowing what you want, uh, you, have that, you have that hunch almost about where you'd like to go. And a lot of people, and I know the majority of people tend to go, right, we're gonna try Australia. If not, then we'll land in New Zealand. If not, we'll go to Canada, uh, you know, because they are easier to get into. They, they almost sort them to say, based on what is easiest to get into is, how, is where we'll start. So you start at the top of the, of the tier, um, I'm just, again, just for the majority of people, not for yeah. everybody. Some people go, wow, I love New Zealand. I want to go there. And that's 100% fine. Uh, uh, I've got nothing against it. This is just us personally. So we, we, we would typically look at the hierarchy of controls. You almost go for, for the highest and you see, can I get in? Yeah. If not, can I get in? Yeah. Can I get in? Yeah. But um, that, only, that only was a very brief thought on our side. I think we decided on, on Australia, given the climate, and we just wanted to go for it. And then after that, I looked at all the ANSCO codes and, and, and the eligible jobs on the short and medium term um, eligibility list. And from there, uh, there was a lot of back and forward on there. On there. Um, I'll probably elaborate in that on a later question as well, but uh, that's pretty much how we went about it. And then when did you actually start the process of putting in your application? Um, I think, and my wife might correct me on this because I, it's, it's not my forte. So probably about three years ago or so, we started initially talking about it. And then um, it took us a while and I inquired with an agent uh, quite a while ago. Uh, or those number of years ago. And then from there, it went quiet for about another year. But I think we used that year to make sure that uh, because we are Christians that we prayed about it and we, that we made sure that we, that we do the right thing and don't just go where, where, where we want to go, but mm -hmm. go where God directs us. 
So um, we felt very strong about that. And then it took us actually another year or odd, more or less, to, to find out that right now, we, now we're all aligned and now is the right time to pull the trigger. I also had colleagues, two colleagues of mine at work that were simultaneously applying for uh, short-term skilled uh, visas or sponsorship visas uh, in Western Australia and they happened to come right but just as they did I lodged the PR application in case I wasn't going to come right and I didn't come right and for that reason the PR application then ran its course and then uh, March last year the visas were approved and then, uh, and then obviously COVID hit. So it was about a week before uh, the South African lockdown. Then we got our grants. And then it was just in time, but it was also out of time given the lockdown and the closure of all the borders. So we ended up staying in South Africa. Um, coincidentally, I was made redundant in South Africa at my job end of September. And I think that also helped with the timing because if I'm made redundant, then we might as well pack our things and head over. Mm. So mm. that was pretty much how that went. So in September, knowing so the the being made redundant is a is a is a process that starts like a month or two before, and then it, it takes a month or two to 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 get thrashed out. So when we knew that, then we already started looking for flights. And we did, uh, when the borders were completely closed, we did a charter flight and we paid for it and it was ready to go. And then it, with SAA, and then the flight wasn't approved by the Australian government. So that flight just went to New Zealand and then the Aussies couldn't, or the people bound for Australia couldn't get on that flight. So they, we didn't get that flight and then we waited a little bit. We we dealt with um, a travel agent as well, who was very helpful, and we eventually got the cancellation. And then I said to my wife, "Listen, we need to go because there could be a second wave, which we now know is in has happened in South Africa, even though it's on the decline. That did happen, and we didn't want to jeopardize our date of March this year to come to Australia. So we thought we just bite that bullet, and that we would." pay that money because the, the the flights unfortunately were about twice the price um because of the covert the covert restrictions and the limited number of flights and i, I guess i can understand that because airlines make their money by flying economy of, of scale so they need to fly a bulk amount of people to be able to benefit from their profit margins that they need in order to run a sustainable business so they had to up the prices i get it it's supply and demand but um yeah, so that's when we decided to go over. And then uh, luckily our flight went ahead because it was amidst, there was a lot of turmoil and there was a lot of um, uh, cancellations, like individual flight cancellations. And we were on all these groups, like the WhatsApp group and the Facebook group and the listen to that. And then you hear this person saying, oh, our, our flight was just bumped or we were just bumped from the flight because they had to do the, the, the caps or take the caps into, more into consideration. And then they would bump from economy class upwards through premium economy and then obviously business if they really needed to. Um, and luckily, our flight just didn't get impacted by that. Wow. So uh, we flight. It, well, I've actually heard of some people who were, as you said, for your previous flight, who were actually bound to go on a flight and then had the cancellation just like days before, like a day before. Yeah, and, and, it's, and, and it's horrible. And my heart goes out to some of them because on these groups, I hear of there's, there's, there's a mother who says her daughter's in Australia and she's got cancer and she needs to get to her daughter as soon as possible. There's other people with a lot worse situations than what we're in. Um, I always told my wife, we're more of a first world problem than what they are. And I would, I would much rather relinquish my ticket uh, or my space on the airplane to them because it's a lot more important. But wow. um, luckily at the time, those people had all come right. Um, yeah. And oh. and that's a nice thing about collaborating online with these groups is people look out for each other. There's a lot of helpful hints and tips. Now, I believe this is, that's what this is for as well. Exactly right. That's what we're all about, trying to help other people who were in similar positions or might be in a similar position than what you guys were in and who might 
try to get out of South Africa at the moment, but they're just stuck there for whichever reason. It might be a visa problem. It might be a flight problem. It might be a skills problem. So tell us about your actual visa application. What category did you apply for, Christian? So when, when my wife and I originally started looking, I am a project manager by trade. And we had a look at the ANSCO codes and I reached out to about two or three migration agents at the time. And they all came back to me and they said that my job falls under construction project manager. So I had to read about construction project management and or what the construction project manager does on the VetAssess website. And I saw that that's not what I do. So uh, project management can, in the construction industry, or I was in the energy, uh, in terms of energy projects or petrochemical projects, you have client side where you work on behalf of the client, then you have contractor side, which is a lot more on site, uh, get, you know, roll your sleeves up kind of work. And what, uh, what, we, what I found after I did that is that uh, I'm, a client side project manager and not a contractor side project manager. And that the ANSCO code specific for construction project manager was for a contractor side. And I knew that if I submitted my skills assessment based on that, that there was a high chance it wouldn't, it may not have been accepted or approved. So then what I did was um, uh, obviously, you know, you get a little bit despondent and and you say to them, listen, is there nothing else? And you try and find a way. And, and oddly enough, at that time, when, 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 when I felt, listen, there's no way, then my wife had a careful read through that. And she found one that is exactly what I do. It's called a project and program or program and project administrator. And it was, it spoke exactly of what I did. It, it's, it's probably a little bit lower um, in terms of your scope of work, but nonetheless, this was one that was on the list. Mm -hmm. So um, the construction project manager was on the long-term visa, uh, on the long-term skill shortage list. And this other one that my wife had found that, uh, you know, injected a bit of hope for us again, was on the medium term list. Now being on the medium term list, you, you can only apply, it only opens up, a gate to x y and z it doesn't open up a lot more as though you would be uh, if you were on the long-term skill shortage list uh, nonetheless we reached out and i explained to the migration agent at the time uh, the situation and what my skills exactly are and he said well cool then we can go for it um so it's ansco code five double one double one two the project and program administrator so that's what it was um and then from there uh, I, they assisted me to do my skills assessment. I initially wrote a three page skills assessment for uh, application for myself. And it ended up being a 20 pager uh, after they reviewed it. So there was a lot of value in that, but it's definitely not something that's insurmountable if you are looking after your money, uh, which we had been, we just wanted to, you do your own little mini risk assessment to say, do we take this risk given the, the, the amount of money that we have? Do we have the money? If you really don't have the money, you can still get it right if you don't. If you do have the money and you don't really want to let go, you're a little bit more hesitant to let go of that money to a migration agent, uh, you need to make that call. It's based on everyone's risk that they are willing to take. We were very risk averse because it's like a one shot approach that we had. Yeah. We didn't have that, that money to recur, like a whole bundle of money to throw at this whole process. So we wanted to just eliminate that risk and we got the agent on board. And that's pretty much how the process began. And that's what I did. And, and coincidentally, the work that I got in Australia was not client side, it was contractor side. So I'm a project manager on the contractor side, which was ironically the construction project manager and scope code that I originally wasn't eligible for. But that's what you did in South Africa. No, no, that's, that's no one. It's, it's similar to what I did in South Africa. So project management skills are highly transferable between client side and contractor side. Um, however, there are some differences, uh, although they could be quite subtle in nature, they are very evident in, in the two different areas. And um, I, I just, I got an interview with the one and I went to speak to them and they were pretty happy um, being that the project management skills being highly transferable between any industry and sector, client side, uh, contract side, 
so um, they also saw it in the same way. And then, uh, yeah, then they made me the job offer. So this job offer is coming up soon. I mean, the job, actual job, you're starting in a few weeks. Yeah, so I'm starting on the 22nd. And uh, as I mentioned to my wife, it's, it's, it's going to be quite a busy time because on the 19th is our daughter's fifth birthday. And on the 21st is our 12 year anniversary. And then on the Monday is the 22nd. So it's going to be quite a busy weekend. But yeah, that's that's coming up. So uh, the, the, the time since we landed in Australia the, the first time around, there's a lot of time that went into looking for work. Unfortunately, it was right over the December break. And then uh, after the December break, I was eager to get started early in January. And people said, listen, mate, there's not much happening between the, the beginning of the year and Australia Day, which is on the 26th, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And then after the 26th, it, tends, it seems to pick up. And even though everyone said it, you still sit and you are hesitant. You still think it's you mm. or your skills or your CV. And at the end of the day, on the 26th, or the 26th or something uh, that job offer came through I got an interview just before then uh, I think I, I hope I'm speaking correct but it was it was it was in that area and then ironically I also got another interview and so I, I went for two interviews and then they offered me that job as well and then you're sitting with a with, with a with a nice first world problem where you've got these two jobs and you need to weigh them so again boop, back into the SWOT analysis and then Make make your decisions. So it was again like pros cons, and and that's pretty much how we went with it. It's so funny how you explain that because it's so true. I found exactly the same. It doesn't rain. It doesn't rain. It doesn't rain. And when it rains, it pours. And it's like exactly. ah. <laughs> yeah. no, all these, look at all these first world problems I have. <laughs> and can I ask, did you do those job applications through Seek, or did you find those positions through Seek, or oh, how did you um, go about? I, I, I wanted to go as wide as I possibly could. So I wanted to um, leverage on my existing network uh, that I had within the industry. So I worked for a company that had a global footprint uh, and they're actually headquartered in Sydney. Funny enough, that didn't pan out into any, uh, any from good conversations that actually went somewhere. Um, but I still try to leverage that network. I did a whole lot of LinkedIn networking, but unfortunately, leading up to the time, I had not been the most diligent at networking properly. So what I mean by networking properly is you don't just add people and send them cold messages. You comment on people, you take part, you, 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 you ingrain yourself in what they do or just to, you know, even years before that's how you're supposed to build the network so that when you come over, you can leverage on it. So I guess my, my, if, 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 if I could do anything different there is I would at the very first time we decided to do the process, connect to a whole bunch of people in your industry in Australia and don't fish for work or anything, just establish that rapport with them where they say, well, cool, great for connecting. This is my knowledge. This is your knowledge on this. Tell me a little bit about your projects. Tell a bit of, me a bit about what you do. You know, oh, how do you guys do it in Australia? Because this is how we do it in South Africa. Stuff like that. So unfortunately, my 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 LinkedIn networking, you know, you get about a ten percent response on cold messages. And at the time, it was important enough for me to, I would, I guess, I would say, damage my LinkedIn reputation a bit by sending all these cold messages. But uh, with those 10% that came back, there were some really, really nice people that wanted to help out. They couldn't necessarily offer a job, um, except for one person who, oddly enough, is a South African that came over 13 years ago. And he works, he, he started his own company, his own project management company. And he just said, look, he's just waiting for some tenders to come in. But, but if they do come in, you know, he'll definitely need assistance. And I was hoping to kind of feature there, but then I just went about my, my own things looking for work. So the LinkedIn part, were, so it was existing network, it was LinkedIn networking, and then it was obviously the more cold stuff like Seek, uh, applying on Indeed, on Seek, uh, just, just, just trying to find anything and everything, even contacting the, the recruitment companies. And most of those led more to frustrations than anything else, because you would submit thinking you're a, you're a very good fit. For a, for a position 
and then you get the response saying if you even get a response you get a response saying listen we've we've uh, got so many applicants in and there's you you didn't make the short list or or you just don't hear anything so i literally applied and in the beginning i would take a lot of effort because i heard that that quality of applications far surpasses your quantity of applications so for each one i truly felt strong about i had two categories the one was i would write a cover letter for that company specific to the job i would sprinkle some of the keywords that they had in their advert i would sprinkle those keywords into my cv so that if they run it through the automated uh, applicant system the, yeah. the automated thing that that throws out all the details then all those keywords would come up as well. Um, it's just a matter of, 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 of finding those keywords. So you put in a lot of effort on those that you felt strong about, but even those didn't come too much because Australia is seemingly very big on local experience. They say, if you don't have local experience, and especially in the construction industry, you need to understand the Australian building code, um, the national construction code, the NCC, you need to understand the Australian standards uh where whereas in south africa so uh, they, they're not very dissimilar to what they are like in south africa but um the australian job market doesn't see it that way they see it as you had experience abroad you have no experience here and now you're applying for a professional position within the company so sorry but we can't help you so so what what, what i did is i eventually got to a point where I found a job that is a, that is cookie cutter, like what I do and what I'm good at. And then I connected with a recruiter. The recruiter was listed on the Seek ad. I, recruit, I connected with her on LinkedIn. I saw her number somewhere and I gave her a call as well. And I, I just went all out and I tried to sell myself. And I did that for the two jobs that I ended up with at the end of the, at the, end of the day. It was the same process I followed where it wasn't just the application, but to do a phone call I'm to cool. say, listen, you know, I, I'm a human being. I'm very good at what I do. Um, I'm, I, I will definitely be an asset to a company, but just to have a, just to have a quick power with someone on that, I think did go a long way. Cause then when she sat, um, when the recruiter sat with the applications, you know, a few days later, I got a call saying, uh, you know, I, I'm working through not the shortlist, but I guess the, the medium, medium list, if there's even such a thing. And I'm busy creating the shortlist. So tell me exactly what you do. And then that was my opportunity. So we spoke for about half an hour, 45 minutes about okay. what it is exactly that I do. She told me a little bit more about the client, what they do. And then she said, right, so I want to put you on the shortlist. And they, she, she uh, presented the shortlist to the client and then they wanted to have me for an interview. And the same on the other side, but I just contacted the company directly instead of working through a recruiter. But the same, the same fruits came from both endeavors. And they were both through Seek in the end? They were, yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, because obviously people want to know what's the best avenue to use. In South Africa, it seems to be a very big thing to use recruitment agencies. And in Australia, it's, it's actually not quite as big as in South Africa. Most recruiters advertise their jobs on Seek. And so if you just go to Seek from the start, you'll see all the positions listed there. You might still be in touch with a recruiter because the contact person, as you'd mentioned on the ad, is from a recruitment agency. So it might still be through recruitment agency in that side. But by actually just listing your name with the recruitment agency hasn't been as effective, I would say, as it would be to just go on to seek and do what you did, you know, just work hard at it and and go really in for the positions that you know you are very good at. And did you have to do cover, um, not cover letters, a selection criteria in your applications? Um, when you say selection criteria, so I have to address it because very often oh, yes, they yeah. have a list of selection criteria and you have to respond to those. Yeah. So that was pretty much what formed my cover letter. So anything that isn't directly addressed by my CV itself or by my resume, which I got down because it's, it's difficult because in project management, you've got to list uh, as part of your resume, you list all your historic right. projects. Uh, so it tends to make your your CV a bit longer. 
And what I had to do is I had to crunch it so it fits in under three pages uh, or maximum four. I think I got it to four pages with all the projects included. So that was a little bit tricky to do. But in terms of selection criteria, I, I, I would I would I would typically have a look at what was what the selection uh, selection criteria were and what my resume addressed, and then anything residual from that I address in the cover letter. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that I comprehensively answer to every single point, even those that I would not be or not have any experience in, like if they work with a specific kind of ERP software, for example, that I have not worked with, uh, then I would say, listen, so I've read up about it. It's similar to other ERP software or it's similar to other software that I've used, but I'm keen to learn that that, that kind of thing, just, just to make sure that you address it as well, rather than just leave it as an omission and then they sitting there ticking all the criteria at the end of the day, then they might say, well, you know, eager to learn, enthusiastic, a go-getter, and then you go about that. But the cover letter also had mostly like soft skills, addressing soft skills more than the resume did. Um, so, and how was your interview? Was that an in-person interview or was it on online? So one thing I, one thing I noticed about Australia is, um, and that's what you mentioned as well when you struck the comparison about South Africa, is that in South Africa, you tend to go more through a recruiter and it tends to be a lot more clinical, where in Australia, they want to meet you and they want to see that you're going to be a good fit, that you, struck, that you strike a good rapport with your colleagues or with the management, uh, where they want to see more who you are. It's not just on paper who you sell yourself to be. So when you go for the interview, you they they do see how they connect with you as well. You, you very often have someone saying, listen, I would get you for an interview, but you know, why don't we go for a coffee first? And then you'll go for a coffee and then they'll kind of see what that person, or they'll see what the person's like. And then they'll say, listen, you know, thanks for meeting up, but uh, I don't think this job's right for you. Or they say, cool, like I want you in for an interview. And they want to get to know you a little bit more to know that you're good for the team. And I think, I think it's a good approach. Um, but the two interviews I had, the one was I had to drive up from uh, West Penn and Hills, where we are now, to Castle Hill, about 15 minutes away, for my interview. So I went in for the interview, uh, you know, got there completely overdressed uh, and with my mask on. And they just all laughed at me when I came in with my mask on. They're like, listen, wait, I don't know where you come from. You know, there's no COVID in this office, so <laughs> you can keep it on, but, uh, you know, take the mask off. So I'm like, no, no. I'm good. <laughs> you'd, you'd rather have it on and then everyone else has it on than to you not have it on and everyone else has yep. it on to make Absolutely. that assumption. But um, that was an in-person interview. And then the other one I had was uh, through collaboration software. So it was like a, it was an, uh, an, um, uh, an interview over the internet. And was only one person and you, like was it a one-on-one -on -one or was there a group of people? Yeah, so... With the job I ended up taking, it was a meeting with the business development manager and with the pre-construction, uh, the, the manager of the pre-construction side of the, of the projects, as well as with the construction manager. And I met with those guys in person and they were really solid guys. And, you know, they eventually, when the discussions went that way, they wanted to show me how they're running their schedules. So construction manager printed out his schedules or he, or he went to go get them on his desk and then when we were talking about uh, estimating projects, for example, then he would go and call Steve, his estimator. And then Steve would just come in and like tell us a little bit about what he does, how you handle the variation orders and, and the likes. And it was, it was actually very nice because you almost felt like you were part of the team. Whereas the, the interview that I had over the internet, over um, Skype for business was, or sorry, Microsoft Teams was, uh, a lot more clinical as well, I guess, because you wouldn't, you don't really see the guys face to face. So I met with the general manager of Sydney uh, for that company, and then with the lead project manager whom I would have been reporting to. And it was just a split screen interview with those two guys. And the one was very engaged and the other one wasn't. And then when I went out the interview, I thought, eh, you know, I did all I could, but if, 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 if they didn't really engage me, then maybe the, that rapport wasn't there. Because the last thing I also don't want to be is someone who I'm not. And if yep. you don't have that rapport with me, then I would rather, uh, you know, I would rather Wake not up. be someone else. And then I get there and then you 
have years of headaches. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so you came November, it's now two, three months later. Have you, do you feel like you've integrated into the community a bit yet? Do you have any friends around yet? Have you, or, or existing friends from South Africa that you've hooked up with? Yeah, so a lot of, um, a lot of the time that we've spent since we've come, uh, apart from the, our little stint up in, in Queensland for quarantine, um, was uh, friends of ours opened their home up to us uh, until, because obviously being made redundant just before we went over, I didn't have time properly to find work uh, in Sydney and also given COVID and that you're offshore, people don't really want to engage with you as much. You really need to target a very specific employer that has that specific need for your <clears throat> very specific skill set as well. So ever since we came, it was a it was a matter of uh, getting all the administrative stuff sorted. So when we landed, we needed to apply for Medicare. We needed to apply our tax file numbers. We needed to you know open the bank accounts. We needed to do a whole lot. And when we got out of quarantine, we had to go and convert our driver's licenses. And then you need to go into um, Medicare or Centrelink or whatever it's called to go and register. And all of that took a while. I thought it was going to be a lot more laborious than it actually was, but it's nice to see that, you know, stuff generally works. Like you, there's, there's no, there's no like mucking about. It's just, there's, there's a, there's a well-functioning system that, that like pushes everything through. But uh, in terms of in terms of the opportunity to make friends, I think after that initial admin stint was over, then you move on to looking for work, um, and then looking for work is a lot of time on the computer, a lot of time on the phone. So you don't really see people, but it was really refreshing to be able to stay with friends after quarantine, and at least you have a little bit of 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 that. There's a there's there's a very big knowledge pool because they've been here for years. When we lived uh, on the earlier in Feb, they got their citizenship. So they went for the ceremony. So they've been here a, a, a good number of years as well. And they had a lot of knowledge to impart on us. And to be honest, uh, apart from that, there's also a couple of people that my wife's been chatting with uh, over Facebook and meeting up with them. And But it's, it's, it's not really friends as yet. But uh, definitely the friends that we have here, the South African friends that we have here, that we can just leverage. But as soon as things normalize, like I've got to start work and we're busy looking for a home now. And as soon as we have that home, uh, I just also didn't know finding a home was such, a, was such an ache. But uh, it's like going for a job interview because they do a 15-minute open house. You walk through and then you say what you'd be willing to pay you know, if you're competing with other people. And then the landlord makes his decision and you submit your references and it's like a proper job application, but I guess it's a rental applica application. Um, but as soon as that said, I was, as, as soon as a lot of that gets done, it would be nice. Uh, the only thing I have done was join a, a squash club and it's nice to go and play squash every now and then. But apart from that, haven't really gotten out, but as soon as things normalize, that's what we intend on doing. Have you guys found a church yet that you like to go to? No, oh, so we've tried a whole bunch of churches. Well, no, I wouldn't say a whole bunch of churches, but we have tried churches since we've been here. Um, we originally went up into Cherry Brook to try a church there that was recommended by our friends that we stayed with. But due to COVID, you couldn't really sing during the worship sessions and you couldn't really do much um, else. And it was a very limited space set up. So it doesn't really give you that, that proper representation mm. of what a community uh, in Christ is like. So we, we, uh, we're still looking for churches. Um, my, my, my brother who's in Cape Town, he's also helping a lot because he's got a lot of international connections um, through his church uh, in South Africa. They do a lot of work with, with churches here. So he's been recommending a few of them to us, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it needs to be something that's a little bit closer to where we are. So he's just yesterday, he recommended another one to us and uh, we're keen to try it out. But until then, what we are doing is we are streaming our local church every every Sunday at five o'clock, which is about eight o'clock, I believe, in South Africa in, in, in the morning, uh, just to get just to get what 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 we need to get, go, uh, you know, yeah. 
carry on our spiritual unfortunately because of COVID, a lot of things have been really icky but if you're a christian going to churches have been really good for south africans who come to find their feet and meet some friends so hopefully when life is a bit more normal and you guys can get around and find a church home that'll be a, an easy integration for you as well because as you say you know ideally you want to find a church that's sort of near where you're going to live yeah. and obviously the people going to that church would be from that area generally speaking and so it's easy to make friends um, but also the other thing is your daughter um who's going to go to school soon that would also or has already started school i'm assuming uh no so so in sydney they start year one uh in the year that they turn six and our daughter's turning five in two just less than two weeks and so we're gonna just put her probably in kindy or in some kind of preschool until until next year and then we just want to make sure that we'd be settled as well okay yes so in australia you can start going to school when you're three years old actually which is quite quite early i know my son has has turned three last year and he started kindy this year um literally yesterday for the first time and um, uh, but that's the first year is not compulsory and then the second year the pre-primary year well they call it a little bit different in the different states um but mm. that's when they start going yeah okay now we want all the ducks aligned we want you to start bringing your kids to school but that would be a good thing for you guys too because then that helps with um with again finding friends who've got interests of the same sort of children ages and you know how how tricky it is if you want to go and do something on the weekend you want to actually go with other people who've got children yeah. who's interested also in riding little bikes or going down the little slide you don't want your it's friends a, to be at the big slides and you're at the little slides it's just <laughs> exactly and uh so the last six years of being in south africa i was on a on work assignment uh in mapungalanga in secunda and there I, um, I think when our daughter was born, uh, it was just when we were moving to Secunda on my work assignment. And my wife actually met most of her friends in Secunda through, through what they call Top Tots in Secunda, which is your, your baby play groups and your toddler play, play groups. Like it's not a formal school, but then you meet other moms and then those moms obviously have husbands. And then, you know, you go over and you have a, of a bri and then you'll like strike a rapport and then the kids like playing together and then you know okay cool so we've made like friends that we can hang out with and hopefully the same or similar will be will happen on this side as well because through your child's life and growing up you will meet their parents and hopefully you'll be able to do that so so that and through the church community that's pretty much where we are tying our our friendship requirements in at this point uh, maybe like social clubs as well like the squash club for example or any kind of social club maybe yep. action cricket or whatever the case might be and then there might be you know a few friends you make through work as well yes now there is that's another thing about australia is there is so much going on outside like there are so many events community events mm -hmm. clubs uh, like even the RSL, you must have seen the RSLs around. You can go to the RSL, uh, have dinner mm. there, and there will always be other people who's really keen to just have a chat. And as you say, hey, mate, how you going, yeah, mate? I mean, <laughs> and, yeah, and the Aussies are really friendly. I, I think one thing that we found is everyone's very helpful. Um, everyone is very cognizant of a multicultural country. And uh, I do I do like that a lot. Um, us as a family, we, 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 we tend to not want to cluster in a cultural group or be in any kind of place where there's majority of one culture only, but we want to ingrain ourselves in you know, everything that Australia has to offer, if it can be as cheesy, cheese, cheesily said as that. But, um, you know, you, you, you want to experience it for being Australia. You don't want to experience it for something that you've had at home. And even though you might long for that and you want to miss that and 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 you you like having a couple of friends over for a for a, for a good fry um it is different i think the culture is different here but 
generally the Aussies tend to be very nice and very helpful. Um, but I think it probably will just take a little while to to have proper friends. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, they say at least two years before you start yeah. making a decision on whether you like it or not so far. Mm. But tell me, what's been the, the best thing for you so far about Australia and what's been the worst thing so far? I think the best thing was to know that all those push factors from Aust from South Africa that 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 there are in South Africa, all the instability, the crime, the this and the that, is it is it does feel a lot more free. Like there's this weight off your shoulders to not want to look over your shoulder at every traffic light, and to you know I mean you can walk at night, uh, you walk during the day or at night you can. I'm not saying go to dodgy areas because a dodgy area stays a dodgy area, but um, you can still you can still walk. There's safe neighbourhoods. My wife and I were researching suburbs in Sydney and the crime statistics. And apart from two or three like real outstanders, the majority of suburbs are generally very safe, and um, we like that about Australia. We we like the fact that that it's set up in such a way where where crime does get punished. Um, I think the, the, the low corruption rate as well among uh, government officials really adds to, to, that, um, to that feel about, about Australia being, being safe. So I must say that, uh, and, and it's probably cliche, but we do, we do like that. We like being able to not have to worry about our safety around every single corner that we walk. Yeah. And the worst thing? So I think I think there's there's I wouldn't say it's like the worst thing, but some of the challenges that we've had in Australia was to accept the the, the cost of living. Um, that a lot of the stuff's very expensive. You would typically pay, and again, it's probably a cliche answer, but but uh, you know if it doesn't, that's that's unfortunately how it is for us. Like. You would pay X rent in South Africa, for example, and you would pay 3X in Australia for the same or for less than what you would have gotten outside. That's obviously if you live in, in Sydney, and I know Sydney's, I think, probably the most expensive city to, to live in in, in Australia. I, I don't know. Don't quote me. It is, but, yes. Um, it, cer it certainly feels like it. But um, <laughs> so, so for rent and for food and for a couple of other things, um, we very often find ourselves saying, but, but you can buy a bag of lemons in South Africa for 30 Rand. So why do you pay over 100 Rand equivalent for them? You know, we must buy our own tree and you must grow your own <laughs> lemons, for example. But, you know, it, 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 it just made me realize that when you look at the UK, when you look at uh, even the Americas uh, or North, North America and Canada, if you look at their comparative prices, you realize that it is just cheaper in South Africa, but it ties in with the economy so that it's sustainable and affordable for the people to be able to live there. Because for how much more expensive things are in Australia, I think your salary more than makes up for that. So yeah. if you determine what you put away at the end of the month after you cater for them for a typical month and uh, being very analytical, I drive a, I drive a tight budget, and then I use that to 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 um, create statistics about the the real comparison to the cost of living in South Africa. Obviously, that, and then the other thing is you clean up after yourself in Australia. There's no such thing as exploiting domestic uh, assistance or the uh, you know in, any kind of unskilled labour force to be able to help you. Uh, in your in your housework so you know we've been in the garden working and and I know some people love that it's just not me but um in the house as well you know you, you just clean up you yeah. you, you yeah you just change your things. ways a little bit and you find that you can actually get away with cleaning up after yourself quite easily exactly and I think one of the things that we've said to each other as well is we've got to know how and what the effective shortcuts are to mm living like we we haven't ironed once since we've been here for example and if you just do it properly like we just shake our shirts vigorously for example before yeah. you hang it up 
and then there's hardly any creases like i don't see a crease on my shirt now you obviously buy for that as well but um you have small little hacks that just makes life a lot easier that buys you that time to be able to live as well and um you can live a lot later on into the night whereas in south africa if the sun starts to set then you better be in your house locked up you know or you need to be in a restaurant or a very controlled uh, place whereas yeah you can if the sun starts going down and you're in the park you just carry on playing with the kids exactly right yeah you just carry on playing and then eventually you'll be like right so we do have to bath and eat still so let's <laughs> Let's, let's let's get going you know and that 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 is very uh that is very nice thank you so much for sharing your story with us it's been really great hearing from somebody who's just recently come off the boat as we like to say um although it's this so not boats coming between south africa and australia anymore <laughs> well not that i'm aware of anyway um and um and imparting all that you have learned so far and experienced so far with our viewers you know you you would remember because it was just fairly recently how uncertain you felt about many things if you thought about coming to Australia just the unknown you know and having to hear from somebody like you makes you just that little bit more at ease on what to expect um, because if you can do it then other people can do it too yeah yeah, yeah because we, we we hit many blockers along the way and when you hit a blocker it's just uh just a matter of trying to figure out how to get past the blocker. Sometimes it's a, it's a proper wall, but we've seen, we had at least twice during the whole process where we thought we hit walls and then we just kept talking about it, kept talking about how we could get around it and we got around them. Awesome. And I think you just persevere and you just think outside the box, you just pray and then, you know. And keep going at it. Just Just keep going yeah awesome thanks so, thanks so much christian it was lovely having a chat and thank you very um, much for having good me. luck with finding that elusive house yeah it seems pretty <laughs> elusive like now, but i'm sure we'll manage the door. <laughs> thank you very very much it's our pleasure take care okay oh, well. bye. bye all right so thank you so much for joining me today if you had fun please remember to hit that subscribe button and then it'll make sure that you never miss a thing I'll see you same time and same place next week. Bye for now.